Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for day four of mystery week we're coming to the end and each time I do a mystery week I always try and fit in a John or Jane Doe case. John Doe and Jane Doe cases always get less views than the rest of my videos and honestly I'm not entirely sure why that is. Maybe they're just harder to search for, the search terms aren't really there. But I think these are just as important to talk about and just as important to watch as the rest of my videos because imagine dying and going unclaimed, nobody knowing who you are and being buried in an unmarked grave. The John Doe we're talking about today is dubbed Septic Tank Sam, which I know a lot of people on the internet don't like the term Septic Tank Sam, they think it's a little bit crude. Um, I'll be referring to him in this just as Sam for most of it. Um, and our story begins in Tofield, Alberta, Canada. Tofield's a really, really small place, about 42 miles outside of Edmonton. The 2016 census showed that there was only a population of about 2,081 people in Tofield, living in just over 800 different dwellings. And our story takes place in 1977, when the population probably would have been around the same, potentially a little bit smaller. And this case taking place in such a small rural town is what makes it even stranger, because there's such a small pool of potential people that could be involved, and nobody's ever said a thing. Just a few miles outside of Tofield, there's a farmhouse owned by the McLeod family, Mavis and Charlie, and they'd recently installed a brand new septic tank on their property. And if you don't know what a septic tank is, in very, very layman's terms, it's basically an underground or very rarely overground tank in which sort of the domestic waste, domestic sewage from the house is pumped through and it basically separates the sewage from the water. And a lot of older houses have these, a lot of places that are like in the middle of nowhere because you're not connected to really a main sewage line. Um, so a lot of houses have these septic tanks. So Mavis and Charlie had recently invested in a brand new tank for the property, but they hadn't bought the pump that was to go along with it because they knew that they had this old tank on their property, so they were just gonna go to this tank, get the pump out and use that one because there's no point buying a new one. So on a warm April day in 1977, it was Wednesday the 13th, they decided to walk across the farmland and go to this old septic tank and pull out the pump. When they open up the 1.8 metre deep tank, Mavis notices this wool sock, this grey wool sock just floating in the water and thinks that's a little bit strange but then she looks closer and she sees a brown shoe and then she notices that there's a leg attached to the shoe. She immediately runs back to the property and calls the police who turn up at the scene very, very quickly. And the police actually start to use empty ice cream pails to scoop all of the water out of the tank before they can get to the body. And within hours, they've pulled this body out of the water. He would later be dubbed by the authorities as Septic Tank Sam. Obviously, they do an autopsy and what they find chills them to the bone. It reveals the true extent of his injuries and it's quite obvious that he's been very, very tortured. Investigating officers described his death as one of the most vindictive and sadistic crimes that they had ever seen. The autopsy showed that he'd been tied up and beaten, and I couldn't find an exact sort of length of time for how long they thought he'd been beaten, but I was able to deduce that they thought it was probably like a few days at least that he was tied up and beaten for. And he was also repeatedly burnt using a small butane blowtorch. You know those blowtorches that like literally blue flames come out of? That's how hot it is. Sam was burnt repeatedly with one of these and over and over again with cigarettes. He'd also been sexually mutilated. His genitals were so badly destroyed that they couldn't determine for quite a while whether they were dealing with a male or a female victim, so I'll just leave you to figure out exactly what they did to him here. He was finally murdered with a shot to the chest and to the head. His body was then rolled up in a yellow bed sheet, tied up with nylon tape, and dumped head first into the septic tank on the Muckleode's property. The killer then dumps limestone into the tank, and we can assume they did this under the presumption that it would speed up the decomposition of the body, and eventually it would just completely dissolve it, leaving nothing to ever be found. But it actually had the opposite effect. It led to a small amount of superficial burning on the victim's skin, but for the most part, it just completely dried up all of the body tissue, meaning that when they actually took his body out of the tank, he was actually very, very well preserved. Again, I couldn't find out exactly how long the authorities thought he'd been in the tank for, but I think it was for many, many months, and they were still able to tell all of what I just told you from the autopsy, 
even though this was a body that had been in water for months. They estimated his age to be between 26 and 40 years old, and at the beginning they thought he was most likely to be towards like his late 20s. And he was fairly short, around 5'5 five to 5'7, five five and he weighed between 145 and 165 pounds. When he was found, he was wearing a blue Levi shirt with snap buttons. He was wearing a white t-shirt underneath, blue jeans, and wallaby-type shoes. I'll put a photo up here. They deduced that it was likely he was a labourer of some kind, and he probably suffered quite a severe illness around the age of five. And they could tell this from looking at his bones and teeth. Investigators immediately set out to try and solve the case. Who was Sam and what had happened to him? They sent out his dental records to 800 different dentists in the immediate and surrounding areas and basically asked all of the dentists to check these against their files and nothing struck a match. They even put details of his dental work in sort of dental magazines and any sort of like dental publications, which would have been read by people all across Canada, maybe all across Northern America and still nobody was able to compare their records to that of Sam. But Sam looked after his teeth and he had somebody else looking after them as well. They were in good condition, he wasn't missing any teeth, he had signs of recent dental work, he had fillings. Somebody was doing his teeth, but none of these dentists ever claimed it was them. From this, the police began to theorise that Sam was transient, he was just moving through the area, he didn't have any particular base, or that he was maybe a migrant. Details of his death were mentioned in several papers across Canada, hoping that somebody would come forward and identify him, but they never received a positive ID match. And Mavis would actually later say that she'd received phone calls at her own home from people all around the world saying like, I wonder if he's related to me, and Mavis was like, I cannot tell you, I just like found the body, I don't have anything to do with the identification of who he is. But then in 1979, a forensic pathologist called Dr. Clyde Snow was brought in from Oklahoma to try and help them to reconstruct Sam's skull and therefore try and get some sort of like facial reconstruction of him. And so Sam was exhumed and Dr. Snow did some really, really good work here. He managed to help the police form a proper facial reconstruction, which he thought and everyone else thought was most likely very, very accurate. But still, it didn't lead to anything. They made this new image, the one that police still refer to today in this case, and they sent out into the public, and nobody ever came forward to ID him. The police had nothing, like they literally had nothing, nothing they could even begin to investigate here. Dr. Snow also found that it was very likely that Sam was in fact a Native American, when previously they thought that he was a white man. And again, this should have made it a lot easier to identify him, because the Native American community is fairly small, but still, nothing. And finally, Dr. Snow concluded that it was likely that Sam was actually in his mid-30s, as opposed to his late 20s, as they originally thought. With all efforts to identify Sam ending in vain, the police decided to focus more on his killer, what had happened to him. But they knew just as much about the killer as they did about Sam, which was, again, nothing. They suspected that the killer was most likely very familiar with the area, either that or they knew a lot about farming and farmland, but it was most likely the former. What made the police think this is the killer knew exactly where to put the body. I mean, this was literally abandoned farmland in the middle of nowhere, it was quite a bit outside the tow field. You'd kind of have to know the area to know that this place was abandoned and he likely wasn't going to be found. And to be honest, if Mavis and Charlie hadn't gone searching for a pump that day, it's likely that he wouldn't have ever been found. Maybe even still today, he'd be there. It did seem like whoever had done this had made a plan, so even before they'd killed Sam, they knew where they were going to put his body, they knew how they were going to dispose of it, which makes sense because he was most likely being tortured for many days beforehand. The septic tank wasn't in an obvious place, it wasn't this huge eyesore that you could see as you were driving down the road. This septic tank was underground and it could only be accessed by this hatch that you'd have to open. So this person knew that on this farmland somewhere, there must be a tank and they went out to find it. But this doesn't necessarily mean that the person lived in the area, it just means that they were familiar with the area. Maybe it's somewhere they grew up or they had family around there somewhere. But then again, if they didn't live in Toefield or the surrounding area and they did come from a long way away, it just seems risky to be traveling such a long way, most likely in a car, with a dead body in your boot. They did look for evidence to see if Sam had been abused on the property or like in the place that he died and they said that it was very, very unlikely. He definitely had died somewhere else and he'd been transported to this spot. The kind of injuries obtained by Sam suggested one of two things. Either the killer had done this before or it was an act of personal vengeance. 
When I talk about his injuries, it's not like he got into a fight and was beaten and then shot to kill him. He was properly tortured. His genitals were mutilated, although I must admit I'm not sure if this was done before or after his death. The torture was sadistic. It wasn't the kind of thing we wake up in the morning and think, you know what, I'm going to go out and get somebody and I'm going to torture them today. This was somebody who had been thinking about this for a long time, had potentially done this many times before, or after this, they would have gone on to do it afterwards. Like, this wasn't just a one-off thing. This was somebody who was so messed up, so sadistic, trying to cause as much pain as possible. The police also found it unusual that it was a male victim. Usually in cases like this of prolonged torture, it's a female who's been captured, abducted by a male, usually for sexual purposes. But rumours begin to spread around Toefield, stories of Sam being a paedophile and a group of locals had made it their mission to put an end to all of Sam's crimes. So they abduct him, torture him, possibly inflicting pain on their own children, they mutilate his genitals, and then they kill him to ensure that he can never do this again. The fact that it was possibly a small town group job would explain how the residents of Toefield have always stayed so quiet over the years. Nobody's ever come forward to say they know anything. Everyone's always remained pretty tight-lipped about it, which you can assume that maybe it's because they don't know anything, or maybe it's because they do know something, they know exactly what happened. And I must admit the theory about Sam potentially being a paedophile does fit in with the mutilation of the genitals because they'd want to harm the part of him that was harming others. But this story about Sam being a paedophile and the locals getting their vengeance on him is just a rumour. It's worth saying there's no basis in that. The investigation into Sam's identity and that of his killer is still open today and I think the answer most likely lies in one of two stories. Either it was a sadistic person, a psychopath who just wanted to inflict pain on somebody else, somebody who's probably done this before or went on to do it many, many times again. Or that Sam was the bad guy and the people of Toefield were just getting their vengeance. But also, as I pointed out, that Sam was Native American, we can't discount the theory that potentially this was a racially motivated murder. Somebody killed him because of racism. Or could the mutilation of the genitals point to a sexually motivated killing or a sexual hate crime? Maybe Sam was a homosexual and somebody really didn't like this. A sample of Sam's DNA has been stored in case they ever need to test it against that of a potential family member, but as of today, they've never found a positive match to anything. With new technology appearing constantly, I think it's very likely that one day Sam will be identified. And once we have Sam's identity, we'll probably be able to find out why he died. And that's the story of Sam Doe, or of Septic Tank Sam. Make sure you subscribe to my channel down below and leave your comments. And I'll see you tomorrow for the last instalment of Mystery Week. Bye guys.